Hi, Jason. Oh, nice to meet you, John. I've heard much about you. So thank you for joining us tonight, uh, those of you in, in person and um, those of you online. Uh, we're happy to have you here. I hope I'm not screwing up your presentation. Um, so before I um, say a few words about uh, the event tonight, I'd like to just begin with the land acknowledgement. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. Um, so again, thank you for coming for tonight's lecture with Kieran Timberlake. Um, I'll start with just the bios and then have the speakers come. Stephen Kieran is a partner at Kieran Timberlake, an award-winning architecture firm established in 1984 and a leader in practice-based architectural research and innovative buildings. He received a Bachelor of Art from Yale University, a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, and is a Fellow of the American Academy in Rome from 1980 to 1981, along with his partner, James Timberlake. Stephen received the first Benjamin Latrobe Fellowship for Architecture Design Research from the AIA College of Fellows. Kieran Timberlake has received numerous design citations, including the 2008 AIA Firm Award and the 2010 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Architecture. Kieran has co-authored six books on architecture, including the influential book, Refabricating Architecture. In addition to his architectural practice, uh, Stephen Kieran has held profession professorships at the University of Pennsylvania, University of Washington, Yale University, University of Michigan, and Princeton University. Uh, Jason Smith is also a partner at Kieran Timberlake in more than two decades leading architectural projects across the country, Jason has evolved a wide range and inclusive design process, resulting in a body of work that is collegial, artful, and spontaneous. He has led the design and construction of several award-winning projects, including Brockman Hall for Physics at Rice University and Pound Ridge House. Jason's approach to architecture integrates art, research, and new modes of project delivery, yielding sophisticated work that is both rich in meaning and beautiful in craft. His projects have been published in Architect, Architectural Record, and Faith and Forum, Faith and Form, and have been awarded internationally, including two Institute Honor Awards from the American Institute of Architects, he has completed three LED, three lead platinum uh, rated projects and two lead gold rated laboratory buildings, a high achievement for an energy intense building type. Um, with that, their bios, I would like uh, myself and you to welcome uh, both Stephen Kieran and Jason Smith of Kieran Timberlake. Thank you, Yolanda, for that uh, introduction. <laughs> We're thrilled to be here. Jason and I are both really honored to be with you this evening and um, to share our work with you. Um, 
we uh, are going to go back and forth a little bit. So what you're going to hear, uh, the talk is structured into four threads of inquiry. Each has an important underpinning and base in our practice. And as always for us, we explore them through work. So you're going to hear four threads of inquiry, four three streams, really. Um, I'm going to do the first, Jason will do the second, I'll do the third, and he'll do the fourth so, and close. So, um, Each of these streams of inquiry really derives um, for us from an underlying ethic of responsibility um, that guides everything our firm does. Uh, the first integration is an inquiry into the, you know, really what we think of as the extensive dysfunctions inherent in the very ways we architects um, interact with contractors and others in the design professions. Um, and uh, it ultimately resulted in a written book that I'll share with you a little bit um, tonight, um, Refabricating Architecture, and a lot of built visions for that are explorations about how to transform the profession. The second thread, renewal, is about really taking care of um, everything and, um, uh, that already exists, designing and building vibrant futures for the past, ultimately. Um, uh, the third, transparency, uh, focuses on expanding the pervasive modern dream of uh, openness, of connection between inside and outside, but doing so in an environmentally um, responsible and ethical way. And lastly, theme of inter intersections um, explores the obligation of architecture uh, to fuse itself to place and make new urbanistic holes each greater than the sum of its parts. So first, integration. I think we as a firm are at our best, frankly, when we research, reflect, and write in parallel with designing and building our architecture. In the last 20 years alone, these um, serial reflections uh, have resulted in hundreds of research inquiries, which in turn have given rise to several books to date with more ahead. The first of our streams of inquiry integration resulted in the writing of Refabricating Architecture. We researched and wrote our Little Red Manifesto um, uh, just after the turn of the millennium. Uh, the thoughts and arguments that it advocates grew out of frustration, not so much with our capacity to design compelling um, architecture, but rather with the tools we have available to us to realize and build it with craft, quality, economy, and speed. Refabricating architecture is in a very deliberate way written over the top of Vers and Architecture. Um, it follows the same seven chapter format as Le Corbusier's text, but visions anew all of his arguments. Nearly 100 years ago, he was um, focused very much on the appearance of architectural form for a new modern age and the transfer of that form from ships, aircraft, automobiles to a comparably modern architecture. Um, for us, you know, 80 years later, um, our lens shifted that focus to the whole of the process that envisions and builds and gives form to our architecture. We ask questions, how might we move the world forward um, in, in a way that we can craft more quality and scope into our architecture for less cost and in a shorter period of time and do so with an ethic of environmental responsibility. That process of moving from conception to construction had, in our view, uh, really changed little since the writing of uh, Vers and Architecture. While form continued to evolve, the substance beneath the surface did not. 
So like Le Corbusier, we turned back to the same industry, ships, aircraft, and automobiles for inspiration. There had been radical change in each of these industries, but little in building design and construction. Among the many transformations in these industries more than 25 years ago is the fact that each was already using parametric modeling to design, assemble, build, and manage very complex, large artifacts. They were leveraging the precision of these powerful new tools um, to fabricate whole sub-assemblies off-site and bring them together um, in a much more limited array of integrated components for swift final assembly. So for us, transformative ideas mean little um, if they're not built. So from the outset, Loblolly House was an undertaking that was defined um, to literally build the arguments in that little red manifesto. It embodies every aspect of the vision we set forth in refabricating architecture. First, it was wholly designed in Revit, which in 2004, um, hard to believe, just 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, was a very nascent parametric modeling software with very, very little established use. Um, we have some reason to believe that this little house may have been its first whole building use. And it was the parametric model, frankly, that gave us the confidence in the integration of the parts and geometries that was necessary to fabricate all the components off-site in advance with the aim of cutting on-site assembly time down to just a handful of weeks. It also embedded the capacity to quantify everything, um, enabling the development of our first embodied carbon footprint more than 15 years ago, which led in turn to the development of our Tally Lifecycle software product, one of the most um, important, still heavily used of those products available to us today. Floor and roof modules were integrated with heating, cooling, and power, along with fully assembled bathroom modules and wall panels. Um, they were all fabricated off-site and lifted into position. The result, we think, is a really beautiful work of precision and craft. It's fused to its site, almost like a duck blind at the edge of the Chesapeake Bay, with an nearly um, infinitely adjustable waterfront wall. Narrow floor to ceiling windows frame the columnar loblolly pine trees beyond and the slotted window um, or wooden cladding evokes the passage of light um, through the surrounding forests. Um, light and air fill the expansive views to the exteriors. A few years later, we competed for and won the opportunity to participate in the 2010 MoMA Home Delivery Exhibition. Cellophane House um, is a fully modular five-story dwelling erected on a site adjoining the museum on West 53rd Street. Modules were fabricated in a New Jersey factory. Um, this more fully off-site constructed modular approach allowed for on-site assembly of about 80% of the house in six days, fully finished in three weeks, and disassembled in two weeks. Front and back modules were designed as tabletops. They were lifted into position with a floor panel bridging the two modules um, at each level. Translucent Plastic structural panels, um, floors and stairs were integrated with LED lighting and they afford a luminous quality throughout the structure. The whole of the house glows um, from within through the illuminated floors and ceilings. Offsite construction came to us um, as a way forward in um, an altogether different part of the world where we are we were approached by an uh, Indian venture capitalist and a real estate developer in Ahmedabad to develop a housing product for the very large and rapidly emerging middle class in India. Let me see if I can get this video operating. Hold on here, just a 
a moment. Okay, um, the product was designed and individual um, components were scaled so that we could use as much human labor as possible in the assembly. The goal here was quite different. In this case, it was about job creation. Um, the components were conceived with transport logistics in mind, minimizing the need for heavy equipment, um, which is in short supply in many of these areas. And low-skilled um, labor can be used in the assembly of the simple elemental housing product. Seen here in a full-scale prototype, the studied and iterated patterning of the facade panels cut down weight. Um, they deflect solar absorption and they provide an elegant decorative surface. Open Home, closer back here in the US, um, we are presently partnering with Bensonwood uh, on this product. It's a mass customizable housing product. It's composed of panels and modules. Four homes are um, in various stages of production now, including this one in New Hampshire. The basis for the product is a simple system of fixed dimension spatial components that can be configured into differing plans with limited customization based on owner preference and circumstance. The first of these homes is now nearly complete. Uh, and you can see it here on its New Hampshire site. Lastly, in this first thread of inquiry about integration, um, I'm going to share with you High Horse Ranch. It's an exquisite single family home for a couple on a hilltop about three uh, hours north of San Francisco. Let me see if I can get this video working as well. Um, this home was off-site fabricated to about 60% of completion and delivered shrink-wrapped to the site for final assembly. Uh, they were lifted, as you can see here, onto the foundation by a crane. Each module is framed by wood columns um, at the corners, each connected by beams at the floor and ceiling. These structural elements uh, and their doubling when joined together really become a feature of the interiors um, derived from the method of assembly. I'm going to skip forward here a little bit. The entry to the house is framed by an existing tree and porch. You enter into the house and immediately turn to the right, entering through the great room. And the window wall here pivots, opening the interior to really expansive views out across um, the valley to the hills beyond. The whole of the house um, is basically an elemental wooden roof floating above wood columns, providing welcome and shelter in a clearing atop the hill. Um, it's an off-site dwelling, uh, off-site fabricated dwelling that we uh, think couldn't be more wedded um, to the space specific um, and uh, place it's in and inseparable from that place. All right, Jason. Our second thread of inquiry um, is, good? is renewal. Uh, from the outset of the firm, we really did commit ourselves to an ethic of responsibility that values the past seeks ways to ensure a future that crosses generations. And this interest in crossing generations is a recurring theme in our work, whether we're working atop um, existing construction or, or, or generating new. I think it's, it's clear to us that, that the value of that forward-looking approach that embraces the past is also an imperative. Um, environmentally. We know that 98% of all the architecture that's going to exist in the world is somewhere already out there. And our philosophy is that we need to own this, to steward it, to continue and extend its life, building upon the past and preserving memory and history. 
but also at times, as you see here in the historic Rodef Shalom Synagogue in Philadelphia, uh, assertively altering and adding to the historic fabric in order to set up the counterposition uh, of contemporary form in a conversation with historic. At our office in Philadelphia, we spent uh, many years renewing a post-World War II beer bottling plant, the Ortlieb's bottling plant in the Northern Liberty section of the Philadelphia city. In addition to the cultural memory um, of that vibrant industry that existed and is fleeting now in our city, um, we, we, we see this as an opportunity to dramatically test um, every day uh, our tenants. So in this case, our tally software demonstrates the renewal and retention of the foundations, the structure of the envelope um, is essentially saving 75% of the embodied carbon over a new building. And we now see embodied carbon as the industry turns itself towards that argument um, as an ever more important asset by which our historic structures can continue to live and thrive. Fairly close at the Houghton Memorial Chapel nearby to us uh, in Wellesley College, we renovated the historic chapel, multi, uh, setting up a, a restoration of that historic non-denominational but Christian faith and spiritual space, restoring the finishes, making it fully accessible, um, while at the same time beckoning towards a pluralistic future. Um, in which a new elevator and stair in the historic narthex signals and gives presence to the multi-faith center that is beneath in the original crypt. This, this original space was renovated into um, a space that's welcoming to all faiths, to collective, small group worship, um, in a way that embraces the multiculturalism of the modern campus and transforms this forlorn uh, basement seen here uh, to the right. That aesthetic conversation across time does develop what we think is a really compelling analog um, to the religious monotheistic uh, tradition. It both accepts uh, that tradition, celebrates new traditions of pluralism, um, and renews the past alongside looking towards um, a vibrant future. That luminous multi-faith worship um, shows up in clear counterposition and conversation with the historic masonry vocabulary um, of those foundations in the originating crypt. Uh, quite close by here in Cambridge at Harvard, um, we've been engaged in a series of planning, design, and construction projects for the renewal of the historic Riverhouse District. The renewals are comprehensive in their scope and include the careful restoration of the historic exteriors and the transformation of some elements of the exteriors, in particular, the interiors with a replete new building systems to give long life to these revered uh, homes for undergraduate students. Here you see McKinlock Hall, which provides a window um, into the breadth of the work that, that we performed at Harvard, transforming the existing sort of disused service alleyway into a new entry lounge with adjoining conference and meeting room spaces. The entrance to the former alley um, is at, uh, centered on, on the brick arch, which now has become um, the uh, primary student entrance facing Memorial Drive and the Charles. Um, and behind the arch, we inserted an elegant new entry, uh, seen at the right here, depicted to the newly enclosed space. The details of all of these projects um, show a the design dialogue between not only new and old um, history, but new and old materials and bases of construction um, with new insertions in former windows, as well as the study alcove that you see on the right, which creates space for people in intimate conversations with the historic and the new fabric in a way that, that didn't exist. And one of the sister uh, college's Lowell House, the former squash courts in the basement, which were a fairly exclusive domain of a single sport, have been enlarged and the program expanded to become a multi-purpose space for films, theaters, presentations, dances, and the seating can be retracted here so that the space can be returned to its sort of communal flat floor use. 
Um, at Dunster House, uh, again, sort of recouping the lower levels, you see a common theme here, finding space in areas which were just pure service and storage spaces. Um, those same squash courts become a comprehensive fitness and recreation center, thereby opening up the program to a much larger constituency of the undergraduate population. There's really very little more satisfying in life and in architecture than making something out of you know, what, at first glance, may not appear to be any sort of opportunity. And such was the case here at the 1950s era Sidwell Friends School Gymnasium. It seemed to be just that, not really much of a building, an afterthought, but its location in, this, in, the, in the heart of campus um, was key to its renewal. It lacked, what it lacked in quality and design and construction, the bones were there, and our Quaker client really decided that in an act of profound um, regenerative design that saving this and transforming it would be the most aspirational act um, to form a new home for their um, meeting for worship ceremony. And we really had two simple strokes in this uh, mid-century building that allowed us a way forward. The first was um, installing a, an improbably thin portico, which helps to provide both presence and stature to the entry to this uh, facility, which is at the programmatic and geographic core of their curriculum. And the second was in the former gymnasium, which was behind the facade. And the brief for the transformation of this space was rather simple, uh, elegant in its, in its simplicity, silence and light an architecture that would allow um, for through the embracement of that si silence and light uh, to bring grade school students through grade 12 into this space for a, for a common goal of worshiping in silence and hearing even the smallest voice. So, um, programmatically and tectonically, the insertion of white sound absorbing plaster admits slivers of light and opens up view at the corner of the space. These plaster ceilings, four in number, pinwheel around two new skylights, which admit a mysterious light at the center of uh, this room for worship and above the void in, in furnishings, thus focusing the attention and energy of the school um, community um, on the meeting for worship. So the sun is, is harnessed in a way to both um, focus the program and to create um, light and photovoltaic energy um, for the lead platinum renewal of the project. Reclaimed barn wood lines the lower walls and the floor of the space, an evocative vernacular reference um, to this once um, agrarian uh, portion of Washington, D.C. The doors and the systems are recessed and all of the sort of functional aspects of the, of, of the space are cleverly hidden within the pockets of this deep set of walls which, which surround and envelop the space. We think you know, the, the result is, is something that celebrates the magic that, that can occur in a home for worship amid silence and light. Unlike that former anonymous, uncredited uh, gymnasium design, adding to and renovating the work of a hugely admired predecessor and master, in this case, Aero Saarinen, it's another matter altogether. So our two decades at work culminated in the renovation and renewal in addition to Morrison Stiles College, two of Yale's formerly least beloved residential colleges. Together with the landscape practice, um, all in partnership, we began with the transformation of Dan Kiley's original college courtyards through the insertion of cascading water features, dining terraces, and other amenities that all then worked in harmony with a new stormwater capture system. The adjoining entry leads past uh, the renovated dining hall in the Saarinen tradition and into stairs that cascade below grade into a new 30,000 square foot addition. And the addition is focused on student life and renewing those exclusive spaces into spaces that could be used for communal contemporary um, events for undergraduate students, including theater, music practice, graphic, arts, exercise, and fitness. The aesthetic result is a true back and forth conversation. 
between ourselves, Saarinen, Olin, and Kylie. We kept the moats as they're affectionately known, but transformed them into skylights and light apertures for the new subgrade addition. These then surprisingly emit light where, where once darkness was encountered and, and is expected. A new courtyard hollowed out of this earth at the entrance to the passage between the colleges Mark makes the moment yet more poignant and this threshold becomes a drawbridge to the new courtyard below. The courtyard itself reveals rather than conceals the addition between Saarinen's original work and the tectonics and uh, let's say construction vocabulary of the modern insertion. The underpinnings become newly sculpted forms. The slatted board of Saarinen's interior drawn out as patches between the new and the old, celebrating that joint and bringing it into focus in a sort of ever-present conversation. Lastly, in this thread, um, we return to Wellesley College. Um, in this case, a project that adds to two buildings of very different eras. Paul Rudolph's 1956 Jewett Art Center, shown here uh, to the left, a brick and concrete building, and Dan Clowder's 1934 Pendleton Hall to the right, um, celebrating the renewal of that quintessential uh, Neo-Georgian representation of his and that firm's work in the West Wing of Pendleton. The first step in this renovated Pendleton was a new, more expansion, expansive vision for the art. So this was originally a double loaded corridor with small rooms on each side and the daylight monopolized uh, behind the doors of those rooms. Uh, the transformation here was to create an open loft filled interior in which the studios are through building, admitting light from both sides and eliminating the exclusive circulation corridor and room uh, on suite arrangement. The addition then is a beacon um, and a portal to the main quadrangle at the college but also a bridge that brings together the Rudolph Designed Art Center and the historic Pendleton while revealing close-up intimate views of, of both uh, eras of building. The language of the addition at every turn is in conversation with both Rudolph Clowder and the history um, of this college campus. Refined white oak slats at the rehearsal hall are tuned to reflect and absorb the sound of that Playment space and the presence of wood is all enveloping, uh, much like it is on the exterior in this beautifully landscaped campus, from the wooded sloped to the harvested and milled formwork throughout the interiors, and finally to its memory cast into the formwork of the exposed concrete on the exterior. Okay, on to um, transparency. Uh, one of the quintessential modern dreams um, that uh, we're going to explore with you this evening. So uh, it was, it's certainly been one of the absolute defining characteristics of um, modern architecture throughout much of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, it has been involved in the exploration of the prospects for this material. Um, for this in idea of an increasingly transparent building. Glass walls that visually join and open um, interior to exterior. While it's ancient in origin, the material's been around for at least 5,000 years, um, there's been vastly expanded research and development um, in this realm, coupled with the transformation of manufacturing technologies uh, that continues to change its prospect for us and for future use. Paxton's uh, Crystal Palace, erected in London for the Great Exhibition of 1851, um, was still present in Hyde Park as late as um, 1936. And it's often thought of uh, as the game changer for a lot of us architects. Um, it was the progenitor of later explorations um, by Mies van der Rohe, Philip Johnson, and many others, whose explorations really continued to this day. However, by the time we started our practice in the mid-1980s, the underlying terrain for the prospects of transparency um, was shifting already, with a real new emphasis on energy efficiency, 
owing at that time to foreign oil embargoes. Further, by the early 1990s, the role that fossil fuel plays in global warming really began to come into um, clear focus for us all. Um, we provide this context here to situate our research and design work within this third framework of transparency, which is always for us underpinned by robust research um, and science. So rather than reject this aspiration, we set out to explore its responsible and ethical use. In the realm of innovative material science, we brought um, these to bear on an exhibit we developed um, uh, for the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. It's a product called Smart Wrap, a mass customizable printed building facade. Uh, it was erected in the garden, the first of their solos exhibits in 2003. Uh, the concept for this facade material was inspired by emerging developments in material science and the digital printing industry. Electronic circuitry, organic LEDs, and photovoltaics were all capable of being printed on flexible skins, polymer skins, trans, uh, really integrating the generation, movement, uh, and conversion of energy to light. We continue this thread of inquiry uh, at Levin Hall at the Penn campus. It's a gateway building at the front, um, really the front door to an otherwise opaque complex of engineering buildings. The result of our research here was the first North American use of an active curtain wall. It's composed of a double layer of glass uh, with return air systems of the building recirculating through that internal glass chamber. The already tempered interior air um, that enters those chambers warms the glazing, minimizing energy use and enhancing comfort. Our commitment to off-site fabrication certainly um, continued here with major building components. Um, and this was an early application of a unitized curtain wall assembly. The double layer wall was assembled in a factory with each panel lifted into position and completed by a small crew in only eight weeks. It really totally transforms the engineering quad um, with its glowing light and presence, and it creates a light-filled interior, a really thermally comfortable interior, and a very energy-efficient place to uh, work, to learn, to research, um, and to collaborate. Our new sculpture studio and gallery uh, for the Yale School of Art soon followed. The program here was quite different. It called for a highly flexible, um, light-filled studio loft space its first year it was temporary home for the School of Architecture where their building was being renovated. So our research here focused us on a, a triple glazed wall with aerogel filled insulated spandrel panels. Aerogel is a um, translucent insulating material with exceptionally high thermal resistance, but it still retains that capacity to transfer daylight. The facades we're tuned to solar orientation. This is the south facade and uh, an expansive uh, solar shading system that you can see here really shielded the building from unwanted solar gain and let in the light we did want. Um, and it creates an almost ornate filigree, we believe, when you see it against the historic um, Yale campus that's actually consistent with, and we believe in dialogue with much of that, that campus. Uh, another sort of conversation across time and place for us. The exceptional performance of these facades enabled a highly efficient displacement ventilation system in the building. It was Yale's first lead platinum building, the first lead plat platinum building in Connecticut. The Michener Gallery in Doylestown, Pennsylvania afforded um, us an opportunity with the addition of really a single room um, an event pavilion uh, within the museum, courtyard, and sculpture garden. The historic courtyard that you can see here is bounded by a remarkable 20-foot-high stone wall that 
was a remnant of a prior 19th century prison system. We um, erected a 23 and a half foot high structurally glazed wall with panels that are made up of four layers of laminated tempered glass. The largest um, of its kind at, in the US at the time of construction. And they extend literally from floor to ceiling without interruption. The result we think um, uh, is a celebration that both defers to and enhances the presence of those monumental hand-laid um, stone walls while establishing a contrasting monumental transparent presence literally at the heart of that historic courtyard. At Pound Ridge House in Westchester County, New York, um, we had the opportunity with a pretty extraordinary client um, to explore a more expansive definition of transparency that includes reflectivity. Um, the occasion for this was this incredible um, rock room, literally, that we found um, at the top of the ridge on the site within which we situated the house. Um, it was a glacial um, ridge, boulder-strewn glacial ridge, formed about 10,000 years ago. And as permanent as the rock ledges and boulders make us feel the mutability of the walls in ever-changing light and seasons remind us literally of the fragility everywhere um, about us. From within the windows, um, frame both expansive views to the outside um, in the left image, and, they, um, and intimate views really from within of the abutting rock ledges that you can see in the image to the right. The facades are clad in four materials, um, wood frame, glass windows, brushed stainless steel panels, polished stainless steel panels, and zinc metal spandrel panels above the windows. The glass allows views inside and out. The brushed stainless steel abstracts reflectivity, kind of revealing color and tone, but not shape. The polished stainless steel reflects the world about in a more mirror-like way. And the zinc panels just receive light and shadow across the day. Obviously, the quantity of glass is a lot less here. It, was designed by us, well, it's not a certified passive house. It was designed to that exact, exacting standard with really highly insulated walls and um, with infiltration testing. And importantly for us, the fragmentation of this wall has eliminated the problem of bird strikes in so many contemporary glazed buildings. The result of it is really an ever-changing painting for us of the natural world one that amplifies and draws our senses um, to an appreciation of the wonders of that world, literally across the times of day, weather, and seasons of the year. And lastly, in this um, thread, I'm going to talk about our recently completed Student Innovation Center at Iowa State University. And it extends these explorations um, into transparency and reflectivity at a much larger scale. It's located at the core of the campus near an iconic water tower. The ground level entry that you can see here allows transparent um, views to the interior, while at times of the day also reflecting the context, including the tower of the water structure that you can see in the facade here. The serrated um, facade provides not only a really elegant form um, and reflection, but from the inside, it provides bay windows that afford diagonal views um, to the campus beyond. And you can see it here um, uh, from the green roof above, where an interior courtyard opens daylight and view down into the lower levels of the building and really provides a welcoming, expansive new home for um, uh, the incub incubation of innovation at Iowa State University. Our final thread tonight uh, of inquiry that we'll share is intersections. We, we see a broader urbanistic obligation of all architecture, 
not, not only to make place, but rather to intersect with the setting and expand our sense of the possible. The difference between place and intersection may seem subtle, but really it isn't. When architecture intersects with setting, the impact radiates outward beyond the boundaries of simple placemaking. Dilworth Park um, in our home city at the base of City Hall had long been sort of poorly imagined, underused, and largely neglected and inaccessible urban space. It was rushed into being for the bicentennial of 1976 in a sort of bi-level, inaccessible, literally and figuratively way, shown here to the left, and our transformation shown to the right. The fundamental act of design here um, leveled the entirety of the park. Um, so that the adjoining streets and sidewalks which bound and border it with trees and landscape could all intersect and flow at a common elevation, uh, opening it to the widest possible use of, for people of all abilities. Interestingly for Dilworth Park, it, w the, that um, entirety of that landscape is really a roof that sits atop a expansive regional mass transit hub that connects subway, trolley, and rail lines um, to the north, south, and east, west uh, termini in Philadelphia. This, this pair of structural glass arcs shown here um, are each a fragment of a circle that's centered on the top of the West City Hall facade, the famous statue of William Penn atop the building. And they bring pedestrians and light um, in the day and night from the park above into the mass transit hub below and bring people emerging from the mass transit hub into this lovely um, experience of, of urban intersection. The glass arcs then, then disappear at night and reveal the city and the city hall in all directions while retaining their sculptural presence um, uh, that is their own um, stake to the park. Wonderfully to us, in a really short time, Dilworth has established itself as the most accessible part of the public intersection of the community and the municipality. Um, it's essentially now become a front lawn to City Hall. Um, it's a go-to place at the center and the vibrant core of the city for protests, celebrations, and importantly, um, just for everyday activities, it becomes a backdrop for the setting and for the city of the uh, for the citizens of the city in our in our true heart. Um, across the ocean, in another um, intensely urban development district in London, our U.S. Embassy, which was completed in 2017, occupies a, a really special place along many of these threads of inquiry. Um, here, we're highlighting its role as an intersector and a generator of urbanism. It's located on the south bank of the Thames um, in the Nine, Elm Lanes, Nine Elms Lane, um, a rapidly developing post-industrial section of the city. And it's the uh, generator and the epicenter of the transformation of this sprawling and uh, formerly placeless warehouse district. It's a remarkably uh, central site to London. Um, it's along the Thames between Vauxhall and Battersea. This transportation infrastructure that existed um, and is extant throughout um, the site included not just the river itself, that historic uh, waterway that was at the center of transportation infrastructure, but also uh, generations of parallel movement uh, of transportation, a heavily traveled um, vehicular roadway that runs alongside the river, and, a, and an elevated railway, which is um, a significant uh, viaduct just a few blocks south. So part of our work here was to translate and intersect all this with a new linear park that becomes a pedestrian greenway that links the whole of uh, this rapid area of development and is integrated into the warp and weft of this part of the city of London. It invites pedestrians into a welcoming gesture of the building, um, not just into the urbanized district, but also to its central feature, which has become this linear park. Once you're within the embassy, there are several interior gardens that are displayed throughout the section and elevation of the building. These spiral upward. They take the infusion of landscape and continue it vertically, not just across the site, but now into the uppermost levels of the publicly accessible and private areas of the building. And the public gathering spaces in the embassy are many. 
one here seen as the gallery and meeting hall lobby, but they contain an extremely significant and hugely influential public art program. Uh, much of this artwork is visible to the public and embraced uh, by the visitors to the embassy each and every day. Closer to your home here, um, shown at, uh, down Vassar Street, right here at MRT, we're in the construction stages. You may have seen the steel framing going up. Um, on a significant addition to the campus, a new graduate student residences. Um, the site is shown here in the red bounding box. It extends to the west from Simmons uh, between Vassar Street and the railway right of way that exists immediately to the north. An important element of the project, Fort Washington Park, is immediately available to the north, although hidden among the industrial and post-industrial artifacts of the city. It's become sort of something of a forlorn oasis amid that, um, that, that district. The zoning overlays of the site, which are significant, really gave rise to much of the massing. The open space and connection from the campus and Vassar Street to the park became the sort of emblematic trail by which we followed, a way to connect Vassar Street to Fort Washington Park through the gateway of the urban intersection and plaza, which hadn't existed and will now be a vibrant part of this community intersection. So the obligations are many. Reinforcement of the campus scale to allow the MIT campus to extend onto this part of, of Vassar Street and complete the, the ring of housing um, about a campus common is, is central to um, our act here, as is the in development, importantly, of a really engaged street life. And much of our work with the MIT and with the City of Cambridge community was about finding out how the architecture and the community, the municipality and the campus could intersect here to welcome rather than separate both Fort Washington Park and the life of this really vibrant, what will be a very vibrant graduate school community. So the entry to the East Building, shown here, draws apart that five-story massing along Vassar Street, creates a way station um, in this necklace of circulation for bicycles and vehicles and pedestrians that runs along the heavily trafficked Vassar Street and reveals an entry court to the larger structure beyond that has its own significant landscape. The associated arcade at street level opens up and engages the interior common spaces which stretch to the left um, all the way down to the uh, Fort Washington Park with the sidewalk, thereby uniting the activity and vibrancy of the graduate school community with the activity and vibrancy of the municipal transportation system and pedestrian flow. Further to the west, um, the streetscape massing separates at, that two, at the two halves of the building, pushes itself out to the street, frames the entrance to Fort Washington Park with a student lounge that opens and engages both the plaza, the plaza and the Vassar Street corridor at the important intersection here between community and campus. Seen from the neighborhood here in an elevated view of Cambridge, from Cambridgeport, the graduate housing connects directly to Fort Washington, amplifies its uh, opportunity to intersect with the city, draws the neighborhood through the campus and to the Charles River beyond. Lastly in this thread, we'll conclude with uh, a project just now being occupied in Lower Manhattan, the new Paulson Center at NYU. This 750,000 uh, square foot building is truly a campus in a building, uniting hundreds of functions of a campus in a 21st century old main. Seen here in the section at the very lowest level, the collegiate and intramural athletic facilities, pools, gymnasiums, and courts and fitness facilities occupy the complete below grade uh, area and 60 classrooms occupy a five story plinth, a podium that begins at street level. The plinth also includes a music hall, three theaters for the Tisch School, one of which is shown here. And the rooftop courtyard uh, surmounts that podium that grounds the undergraduate residential colleges and provides a community space for uh, that student life atop that and connects it to the faculty residential tower seen just beyond here um, in this image. Circulation seen here at left is pulled to the outer boundaries of the site program is pulled in. It allows the streetscape of Greenwich Village to intersect with the streetscape of this campus within a building. 
and street level entries then open up this commons to the heart of the new center, creating a dialogue between the activity of campus and the activity of the community. The whole of the new Paulson Center there is a, thereby is, is a vibrant contributor to that community. The urbanism of the campus and the urbanism of the village coming together, inviting pedestrians in and offering views out. It's our hope that these four threads of inquiry that we've journeyed through with you this evening provide a window into the breadth of our aspirations as individual architects and as a collective firm. We seek out deeply ethical trajectories, as Steve said in his opening, and pursue those trajectories holistically through our work, advancing each across time, project by project. These ethical trajectories then persevere and provide a common thread throughout our work, as you've seen this evening. We set out and continue to try to make a principled architecture, one that is founded in the world that we have all inherited. Form informed simply by personal preference and preconception isn't interesting to us. It's simply indulgence and novelty for its own sake. Rather, we seek an architecture in which materials and their assembly into systems are alive to us and the users of the building. Through our, these threads of inquiry, we seek to penetrate the nature of materials and systems with which we work and make them obvious and transformative in the lives of the users of our buildings. We believe thereby in an architecture that's grounded in the broadest possible conception of what it means to sustain and to renew rather than consume the world in which we live. This includes the renewal of what's already here and the stewardship of the natural resources we consume each day within our buildings, water, energy, air, chemicals, and oil. We believe in an architecture that's formed about the most deeply seated needs of humans, the desires and aspirations of the people we serve. We never take these needs for granted. We seek and evolve methods of inquiry that uncover the wondrous and often conflicting diversity of aspiration, belief, use, and need of those that we serve. And finally, we seek a poetic that moves and touches, one that extends the desirability and beauty of the world about and within it. We think of this as the fullness of architecture, and it can only be achieved by more, not less. The more holistic the architecture, the more resonant, the more full, and the more beautiful it will become. With that, I extend our thanks, the thanks of Steve and I and our partners in the firm for this invitation, and would love to open it up to questions from the audience. Can you go up here? Everybody get ready with Q&A. TJ. Thank you so much for taking the time. It was a great lecture. Um, I was wondering, because you gave us your, um, your four almost core principles, and another thread that I kind of see throughout your work is this idea of collaboration. Um, a lot of the spaces you've shown us today are even like spaces for collaboration, the number of schools and um, dormitories. Um, so I was curious, yeah. And just as a practice, also both of you being partners for, I don't know, how many years now, could you speak about this idea of collaboration and its importance in architecture? Go ahead. Well, it's a really timely question because for our industry and for design and more broadly, this notion of collab collaboration in the wake of the pandemic has become you know, like a very acute need for us. And I, I'd have to say that, that, that Steve and I and our partners have sort of purposefully restructured our methodologies of collaboration in order to bring our teams and our staff back together, but also to identify opportunities for our clients, many of whom are academic or cultural in nature, to bring people back to their facilities. And so this thread that you've noticed, we appreciate you noticing it, is, 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 is part programmatic. I mean, we seek programs that are designed to bring people together and to bring communities that might not always contact one another into commonalities. A really great example of that, actually, Steve didn't talk about it, but the Iowa State Project started off as 
a project for the School of Engineering. It's going to be a maker space for the School of Engineering. And in our early work with the programming committee of that institution, which we learned over the course of many months, we expanded that to a university-wide resource. So now instead of one college sort of having provenance to that space, it's become a resource for six colleges and has allowed that community to come together in ways that are never, um, uh, you know, they're sort of a force multiplier. And we really believe in that thread of bringing ourselves together and the communities that we work with together in a, in a, in a pretty open and vibrant dialogue so that we can grow um, and amplify the work that we do. And we always are seeking to do more of that, not less. You know, the one observation, you could take the collaboration question um, out to our clients, but we can also take it into ourselves and our profession and how we all work together, um, not just as architects, but how we work with all the hundreds of other people involved in the making of any, even, even small buildings are really complex in terms of the number of people involved. So um, that first section, in a way, um, originated more from that notion of collaboration to look into our own selves and our own souls first um, about how we can be better collaborators with those that we have to work with in order to make wonderful architecture. And um, that remains a challenge you know, for the profession largely to this day. Lots of um, opportunities out there uh, lie ahead. Lots of different modes of construction delivery going on now that are more integrated than they once were. Um, but lots of work to be done that lies ahead. So, and that, so that's, I, th I think the question has two parts for me. It's outward to our clients in the world that they and we inhabit and how to col you know, create collaborative environments f for them, but also how can we be better collaborators ourselves? Here's, but, uh, I think it's a two-part question. Can you talk a little bit about how the firm is structured such that you can do something as small as a single family home and then something as large as the project you just showed in New York City? Because the, the scale difference is just so extreme. And I think part two of the question is the technological innovations that are an important part of the firm, do they, do they trickle up? from the smaller projects to the bigger projects, or do they trickle down from the bigger projects to, to the smaller projects? Great. Yeah, two wonderful, <laughs> um, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, once you take the first part, the question of how we manage to do things as small as houses um, and as large as the Paulson Center at NYU, and uh, I'll try and reflect, give, take myself a moment to reflect yeah. on the second part of the question. I guess, uh, you know, just to start with purely pragmatic issues of that, we, you know, we've always tried to manage the practice to a size that doesn't allow us to get too far out of contact with clients who might demand a more personal, more intimate approach. So, you know, the practice in this in this era is around 90 people and has been a little more than that and a little less than that but we've always felt like we can manage projects of scale with that size and and that that one is at the very upper end of the scale and we have a collaborating architect with that which is another modality that we enjoy but we've always managed the practice that way and the other bit of it is really critical to how we orient ourselves is that we're not organized into studios or expertise. We don't have designers and project managers and, and um, um, construction administration specialists. One of our staff members here, Tim, who's leading the MIT project is here. And Tim is, is a hugely skillful and talented designer. He's also an incredible technician and he's great with managing people. So because we don't separate people into those roles, nor do we separate um, the people who do academic work and the people who do developer work and the people who might do I know, cultural work, we allow a lot of people to kind of touch a lot of different things. 
And so, you know, the organizational methodology tries not to create fractures or silos and it allows, you know, in the kind of tradition of the, of the great generalist that, 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 you know, many of us are very fond of, it allows people who are interested in, in touching a lot of things and being around a lot of different opportunities um, access to that. And so between scale of the practice, but more principally an idea of a kind of dissipated you know, series of organization where lots of people are interested and can do many things, um, that allows us to get access to that kind of work at both ends of the scale. Yeah, we, we usually value the diversity of scale and in part for the reasons suggested in the second part of the question. Sometimes you can do things when you're dealing with one family that you can't do when you're dealing with MIT um, or any <laughs> larger entity of any sort. And um, so the houses can become a forum for a depth of exploration that could be really difficult. Batteries on his microphone died. Can you just give me this? Give it to him. A good example was. Um, Thank you. The idea there was to literally, we, you know, we had written a, a little book. We wrote it real quickly, several months. We, you know, it was something that had been coming into our consciousness for years of frustration. So we just did it, wrote it quickly. And next question is now what? So what? You know, so um, that little house, it's just four rooms, was just loaded up with um, aspiration, you know. Um, to build a Revit model, to give you some idea of how difficult that was in 2004, it took 6,000 person hours, three years of labor by our staff to build that model because no parts existed. Everything had to be built from scratch, every single component in it. And um, it was an insane thing to do, but on a house, you can say, you know, it only diverts a couple of people in the firm. We can manage it economically. Let's do it. We gotta move this thing forward. So there's definitely a part of that in the houses sometimes that you can get to that can really help you and leverage and propel, you know, the next levels of, um, you know, of being able to do things. Because the risk is relatively low in a house. You know, they're, they're still expensive. They're still meaningful for the people that are live there. But, you know, they're not affecting hundreds of and even thousands of people with the magnitude of money that goes into larger buildings. So they're, de they're definitely something of a Petri dish. So or can be. So I have a question. <laughs> Thank you again for your lecture. Um, my question uh, it has to do with the innovations that you do, and I think it's twofold. One is uh, how you pay for them, <laughs> because you're doing innovative work, but often it's the first of its kind, and so then you're, like with the Revit model, um, you know, you're innovating and it's always expensive to do that. So, you know, in any firm when you're doing research, there's the kind of dance with how you pay for the research as you're doing the work. Um, but then the other question, which I think is the one that's more important to me, is how you navigate that with clients, like how you kind of bring them in to these new and novel ideas. So that goes to the collaboration again. Yeah, um, I'll start on the expense side and you can go to the other <laughs> Thank one. Thank you. I mean, the, I, I mean basically, um, you know, we're not a profession that's noted for earning huge amounts of money. And uh, as you know, so there's not a lot of surplus. And we are all competing um, in an open marketplace, so there's definitely fee constraints across the board. Um, so one has to be incisive about where you decide um, to go go deep and expend some funds. We do um, operate the firms and have for 
decades where we invest a lot of time in research and writing and we allocate that you know as any other resource in the office um, and it has to be incisive for us we got to really hone in on an opportunity make sure it's an opportunity and understand the resources necessary to do it and then go do it it's most of our research work certainly in the early years some of it was grant funded the latrobe prize actually frankly was the incubator that got us going we got we won that and it was a significant amount of money at the time for us and it allowed us to hire a couple of people to just work literally on that side of the equation research and we saw the value in it and continued afterwards we we are f f we do have some external funding for research but a lot of it is in internally funded and we we just look at it as part of um, what you have to do to exist in the world most corporations have budgets to invest in research the government has budgets to invest in research and we just decided after that first experience with the latrobe prize to um, reinvest you know pour some profit back into research and it's what what companies do to get ahead is what our profession needs to do to get ahead it's difficult for us because we tend to be a very fragmented profession with many small entities you know not that many really large players so um, you know we're careful about it but um, it's it's mostly managed you know as a portion of the profitability of the firm it's difficult to get a client to pay for it sometimes we're able to get clients to invest in certain things of real that they have demonstrated value for them um, but but it's problematic you know for sure and an ongoing uh, dance if you will between how much you can expend and where you want to go and what the resources are we, we've had a I would say um, a mixed relationship with getting this out into the domain of our projects Yolanda I mean we we've we, we have some really, um, what I would just say is like brilliant people in our research group who honestly can overwhelm anyone, um, even someone at the Institute who's extremely accomplished. And so, I, you know, part of our, part of our role um, in managing the practice is to harmonize the really ambitious work of the research group with the really profound needs of our client groups. And um, that takes, you know, sort of no, another layer of, of oversight, but, but, but really another layer of collaboration and cooperation. One area that we've, we'd love to be more successful, um, and a plug, I see Vaso here, a plug here for the Institute's um, goals, is in post-occupancy evaluation. It's remarkable how little building owners actually want to know about the way their buildings work. And, and our research group has been really keen to find uh, client relationships that allow us, for better or worse, to evaluate the way our buildings are working after we turn them over to the owners. We've got an active project right now with the University of California um, at a project we finished called the Institute for Energy Efficiency of all things, that we really can't get the client to determine how efficient their building is. And part of that is bureaucracy, part of that is politics, part of that, a big part of that is just fear. You know, sort of like you don't really, as long as your car's running, you don't really want to look under the hood and see what might be wrong. And, and I think this is an area where as an industry, we can uh, dramatically improve. You know, I, you know, you go to the doctor for checkups, you take your car for routine maintenance, but buildings are kind of set it and forget it over time. And so this is an area, Yolanda, where we've, where we've spent a lot of time and a lot of resources getting partnerships with clients that believe in this sort of ongoing relationship to allow the research ideas to become the research reality. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, I wanted to ask about embodied carbon. I really enjoyed seeing your um, initial analysis of the Loblolly House and how like, groundbreaking that must have been at the time. 
I'm curious how you keep that as a focus as you move into these much, much larger projects where things like code and, and fire ratings and things like that push you towards a much more carbon intensive type of construction? Uh, simply, you, ha you have to be willing to ask the question at, at every single turn. Uh, you know, we, we, we have had as many failures as we've had successes. Um, we're signatories, as many firms are, to the 2030 commitment from the AIA, but that's exclusively the provenance of operational carbon. We feel like we have a pretty good handle on how to help our clients um, and our engineering teams manage operational carbon. We've made huge strides. Um, we didn't show it tonight, but we keep an active dashboard manned by the research group of all of our projects, which tracks their operational and embodied carbon throughout the design phases. So you can go into that dashboard. It's available to all the staff at any time and see how your project is stacking up against other projects. Internal competition never hurts, right? Um, but, it, but the embodied carbon question has become, you know, something where you have to ask a question a thousand times. You know, are we, do we really need to make the foundation that thick? Do we really need to use that, that uh, uh, much cement or carbon or what, uh, you know, what, what we might otherwise think of as a de facto solution? Um, and it's not easy because the building codes, the building officials, and many, you know, sa health and safety and, and other, you know, kind of supervising authorities haven't evolved to this point yet. There, you know, in the news, you, you know lots about, about uh, cross-laminated timber, for example. Um, and the, the further we can penetrate the sort of bureaucracies of approval and safety, the more likely it is for that to become economically feasible. Because right now, a substitute for anything other than conventional carbon is, is conventional construction is usually seen as short term more expensive. And so, what we try to do is to work broadly and ask questions in communities, including communities where we're working, like um, Seattle and British Columbia, where actually, because the power sources are relatively carbon free. The, the, the turn to embodied carbon becomes much more profound. So we try to use those projects as a flywheel to be able to talk about embodied carbon in a way that allows us to increase the knowledge base of all of our clients. Yeah, one thing I, I'll add to that is the value of the software tool that allows us to calculate embodied carbon at the speed of design. It doesn't help if you've got a tool that allows you to do that at the end of design, you're done. So, um, you know, that, that's what occurred to us when we took a look at Loblolly House 15 years ago and ran the numbers on that. It was stunning, it's a little house. And it's still, I don't remember the number, it was up there 200,000 pounds of carbon, it's a lot. So, um, it got our attention, you know, and the software tool was designed to really work at the speed of design fundamentally so that we could at least, I mean, the first way to change behavior is to make, is to understand it and identify it early on. So that's, that's part of the solution we think is just think about it. it it's like money, you know, it's a limited resource. Um, you got to count it. You've got to shepherd it. You've got to figure out how to get more for less. And uh, so that's, that's part of the passage forward, is just knowing as you design what you're doing, how much it's costing, how much carbon. Um, thank you. It was an amazing presentation. Um, and I, I'm struck by, I mean, the, the degree to which uh, your work is so sensitive to so many fronts, social and uh, contextual and so forth, um, and, and yet has some part of the origins of a lot of the work are rooted in te technology, like the, 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 one of the earliest Revit projects or material studies. And it, I'm, uh, by comparison, I, I think there's other firms um, that uh, were exploring those technologies at the time that um, adopted them wholesale and made them central to their identity and, and kind of ar architectural expression and um, saw them as, you know, potential new business models, you know, for or, or kind of, um, or spun off, uh, tried to spin off uh, modular firms or, or, you know, and yet um, it didn't seem like that seemed to inform a lot of your work without being 
foregrounded, if, if that makes sense. And I'm, I'm curious if that, the degree to which that was a conscious um, decision in, in the practice or if that was always a trajectory uh, that you had that there would be this kind of balance between, um, the, uh, you know, technology and other interests in your work. I mean, we've, I think, always thought of architecture as in being in equal measure an art and a science. And we try, and, and we do believe that the science gets better because of the art, and the art gets better because of the science. And we try and weave the two together um, in our thinking um, and writing and practice, building by building. And, um, you know, in general, architecture, the, the poetry of architecture comes out of the constraints of it and how you confront those constraints. And when you add technological constraints to it, the art gets richer. When you add artistic aspirations and poetic aspirations, the technology gets richer. Um, so I think lots of firms tend to separate the two worlds. You know, they're in either camp. And we try to kind of um, move seamlessly between both, you know, in a more fundamentally humanistic sort of way, almost a renaissance sort of way, where you have to be able to do it all and have, have enough knowledge across all the realms to be able to draw them all together. And uh, it's not an easy place to be, um, for sure. But, um, but it's very satisfying. We think it creates an architecture of fullness that we enjoy, so. So our um, fine architecture school here is currently going through its NAB accreditation process. Um, uh, uh, hopefully once every eight years. And it's not something a lot of the students necessarily see, although they see their professors getting anxious in the semesters that will be under under inspection. But, you know, if, if, uh, our current, um, our, our recent and even our, our current um, accreditation guidelines um, relate in an interesting way to what I would say are the superpowers of your practice or some of the most manifest superpowers of your practice tonight, which are uh, the synthesis of, of design decisions and technical systems and the, the, um, uh, the kind of integration of those systems with an overall um, uh, design idea. These are some of the most subtlest and most important skills of architecture. Um, they have led within the culture of architecture schools, as I'm sure you're aware, but um, uh, to um, uh, a kind of uh, various experiments with things like integrated studios, comprehensive studios, etc., which I don't want to speak for the students in the room, but are often some of the the least enjoyed <laughs> and the 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 most um, uh, uh, difficult and painful parts of an architectural education. So, as someone uh, uh, as 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 a kind of um, as a leading practice in terms of an exemplar of of this actual work, what do you think? of how these skills are taught and should be taught. And irrespective of accreditation, how do you look at the, the, the um, symbiosis and, and, and synergy and synchronicity between a time spent in school and a time spent in apprenticeship and practice um, and, and back to what, how each of those support each other pedagogically towards the kind of work you've shown tonight? Question within a question within a question, I guess. Yeah, the, um, mm. Well, I, I can start by saying that I think in the last decade, we've seen pretty profound efforts on the part of almost all architecture schools to develop stronger collaborative and coordinative skills in their student body. And, and I think that's, that's had many fruitful results. It, 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 I think it has, uh, whether those projects were enjoyable or not enjoyable, it has allowed early career folks who come to a firm like ours to understand the importance of viewing our collaborative partners as amplifying our work and not as some necessary evil because the building needs to stand up or because the building needs to be hot or cold. We also tend to, um, 
almost exclusively work with the partners on that side of the consultant roster that share that same philosophy. They tend to be firms that, if not, if not multidisciplinary, are certainly interested in reaching across and understanding what the architects do. And I think, you know, our, our intersections with, with students have certainly testified to the fact that there's just more exposure in that now. I think the other piece of this, and this is maybe subtler and um, might not be altogether agreeable, but I think the idea of the heroic singular architect, which has been the foundation of you know much of education for decades, if not centuries, has begun to erode in a positive way. Um, and collaborative practices like ours, in which um, the six partners and principals like Tim are you know, sort of robustly determining the future outcome of the firm, not only in terms of its government and management, but also in terms of its design ethos and even the projects that we work on, we think is an example of that. Now, you know, we were just talking about this earlier today, it's Tim and I, it still does require sort of guidance and fellowship and mentorship in the way that a, a good studio critic does. So we see that as an opportunity to, you know, unionize practice and education in a way that, that might be um, the academy and the profession didn't think of. Uh, we also just have, you know, there's just an, evo an evolution of generational culture here. We see just stronger demand um, from our young architects to be interested in many things and not to be heads down working on a set of details until they're finally complete. You know, we see a lot of interest in digital technology intersections with the research group, intersection with the com communications group. Some of that is pedagogical, but some of it is, is just generational change. Um, and we're trying to embrace that. On the education side of the equation, you know, having taught a lot of studios that made efforts at collaboration, um, as you would expect, that would be something we'd be interested in. Yeah, it's really difficult, and I, I agree that oftentimes they're not as satisfying to students. And I have a couple of reflections on why that may be so. I think one is just the point in the career that they are at compared to um, where you are, or I am, or Yolanda is, or Vaso is, there's um, a skill acquisition that um, is hard won in school and in life as an architect, and uh, it becomes easier to collaborate with others when you've got the the skill set really honed and refined. So that's just a speculation on my part that there's just too much anxiety about um, do I have the skills, do they have the skills, should I listen to them, um, how do I know what is going to be positive that I can take from this collaborator, what is not. So I, that may be part of it, it may just be something that um, ironically we can try and teach in school but may just really come to fruition best when you actually have to build something and realize there's no way to do it if you can't figure out how to get along with, you know, 150 other people and, uh, you know, and get everybody kind of teaming together or otherwise we're all going to be miserable and nothing positive is going to happen. So, um, I just want to add one anecdote. We, um, we occasionally hire students with really shitty portfolios. And we don't do it because we want people who can't really design at the practice. We do it usually when we know that student because we've taught them or because we've had an experience with them or maybe because we've given a lecture and they've come to talk to us about it. But we do do it on purpose in order to allow entry into the practice on grounds that are more wide ranging than just can you put a beautiful portfolio together. And especially in the digital age now, a beautiful portfolio is not necessarily a the only indication of real design talent and effort. So sometimes when we hire a student with a pretty crummy portfolio, um, we allow them to sort of seed some other students. And, and we've actually seen 
some really strange and wonderful success out of that. And um, it's, a, it's only an occasional filter, don't get like any ideas, but um, uh, when my colleagues and I who are working in the hiring group all, sometimes reflect on that, um, about giving an opportunity to a student that we know has other skills that can populate and permeate the staff, um, and they build their design acumen and talent over time. Um, that's an oddity, but it's, it's tended to be um, a healthy oddity for us. Thank you for the lecture. Um, so we've talked a lot about collaboration and kind of with the Iowa State project, we talked about how uh, essentially it turned into a space for all six of the colleges that you're talking about. Um, we're able to come into this space. So the question is, uh, in working with clients and breaking boundaries and barriers that are uh, so strong, uh, what are the challenges that you face in doing that? Um, how academic units pay for things, you know, in an academic environment is often segregated. You know, the, 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 the architecture department has this funding or the engineering college has this funding. That can be, an, that can be an impediment. Um, the vernacular by which different folks communicate can be an impediment. If you're working with a museum client, um, they sort of understand the intellectual and artistic language that you might bring forward. Um, if, you know, if you're working with a, we have some developer clients, selected developer clients that, you know, where we have to sort of retrain them into, into entering into that uh, conversation. I think one, one of the things that we're pretty adept at um, is drawing people forward. And because the practice is centered on like lots of voices and lots of listening and lots of conversation and collaboration, um, we tend to have um, pretty good skill set in bringing people forward from where they are. And you know, one of the most gratifying things when you go back to a building that you've built for a client isn't necessarily that it solved all their problems or that it works perfectly. It's when they say to you, I never dreamed it could have done this or I had no idea we could communicate this way. Um, so those sort of incidents and intersections are an area where I think we really try to draw people forward. And ultimately a client has to take that you know, leap of faith with you, particularly when it's offside or outside of their program sheet or outside of their budget model. Um, and, and that's uh, a heady challenge for us and I think for any great firm who wants to bring people outside of their normal course of action. I mean. Just to reflect on Steve's thing, if, you, if you're going to be poetic as well as pragmatic, you have to be willing um, to work with clients that, that will take an occasion and take a chance and take a risk in order to achieve something that's, that's spectacular and outsized what it, what it is. And so the search for clients like that always goes on with us. On the um, building side of the equation, there's a lot going on on that front in terms of integrative models that we, you know, we've explored every single one of them. And whenever a new one comes along, we want to get in and try and figure out whether or not it, it's helpful. So we, hardly anything we do anymore except some government jobs is design, bid, build. That tends to be the most contentious model, or can be. Um, there's. You, the, the majority of the projects we build have some degree of integrative model between builders, designers, engineers, fabricators, um, and all the people involved in the making of it. And there are lots of different flavors of it, but that's been one of the most positive parts of the last 20 years, I think, has been the increase in integrative models for how we go about relating to each other and building in more integrated ways. So we can access the intelligence of a mason, for instance, on, you know, um, on an MIT project um, and harness it to make better, um, more long lasting, more technically proficient um, and aesthetically beautiful architecture. So. That's a positive part of integration, in our view, in the last positive development. It's ongoing. Nothing perfect yet, but 
move trending in the right direction. Thank you, Stephen and Jason. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Please, we're going to end now, but if you have questions and you want to come up to Stephen and Jason after the lecture, please feel free to do so, at least for a little while. Um, so thank you uh, to the faculty, students, and staff for um, participating in your presence um, and also behind the scenes to make this happen. Thank you to those who are in person and um, just watching remotely. We hope you'll join us next week, uh, March 16th.